everybody and welcome back to the channel for another episode of Moron Gets Peer Pressured into cooking foods that are popular on the internet that are usually either incorrect, offensive, or just dangerous. On this week's installment, I asked you guys to send me the most popular potato recipes of all time, and you guys delivered by sending me the million layer TikTok crispy potatoes and the fried chicken alley go, as well as some stuffed potato pancakes and some potato roll samosas. If you like what we do around here and you want to see more, take a second to like the video for me, please. It helps out a ton, but let's get right into this one. For no reason whatsoever, I figured I would work backwards today from the list I just gave you and start with the stuffed potato pancakes that racked in a total of 7 million views. I grabbed some Yukon Gold potatoes and some salt and pepper, flour and butter, as well as paprika, an onion, some ground beef, an egg, and some mozzarella cheese. As you'll see throughout this video, I tried to find and select a mix of different potato preparations. Some are sliced thin and deep fried, some are going to be mashed. And these ones are eventually going to be turned into some pan fried stuffed potato pancakes. And I started by peeling them, chopping them up, and boiling them off for about 8 to 10 minutes. I will admit right off the bat that even though 95% of what I'm doing here comes from the video from Little Strawberry Kitchen, the one with over 7 million views, the mozzarella was a very late stage addition that I saw from another video, so I'm basically combining the two most popular potato pancake videos here. And of course, as always, you can find both of those recipes down in the description after you finish watching this one. Besides the mozzarella though, this is getting stuffed with a ground beef mixture that's going to be seasoned up with some onions, some of that paprika and salt and pepper. And the second half of the potato preparation is very simple. You just run them through your potato ricer, mix in your egg and your flour, and then combine all your components and fry them off in your pan with some oil. I think I have said this in the past, but when it comes to the potato, I very much take the same stance as Claire Saffitz does. It's gotta be one of the most delicious and just straight up versatile raw ingredients you can start with. There are literally thousands of potato preparations that are all so good. And it's one of those flavors and ingredients I will never get sick of just because of how many different forms it can take. The humble potato is one of the most underappreciated and underrated foods us humans have access to and I will die on that hill forever. Anyways, now that my love letter to a vegetable is complete, I began stuffing my pancakes with a heaping tablespoon of the beef, plenty of the cheese, and you kind of just want to mold and form your potato mixture over the top, pinch together any of the seams and pat it out flat, and then cook them for two to three minutes on each side until you get a beautiful crispy golden brown. I literally just ate a meal and I only just started filming this video, but this has made me unbelievably hungry once again, so let's give them a shot. Who invented the potato pancake, by the way? I feel like it's got a pretty big presence in multiple different cultures. Uh, is Atsy and I gonna set off a, a war in my comments? Possibly. I also have some sriracha and sour cream here because I think that's what they had on their plate in the video. I gotta say, they don't feel like they maintained a whole lot of crisp. They're quite uh, squidgy at this time. How about a cheese pull? Not too bad. Mm-hmm. For the pros, uh, there's the perfect amount of beef and cheese in there. Potatoes are delicious, as uh, as I already said. There's a few cons, though. I might have made them too big, and I might not have cooked them for long enough, but they are really just falling apart. There is, like, very little crisp on them. They also retained a whole lot of oil. I feel like the sriracha is pretty smart, because it kind of cuts the ratty... <laughs> there's a few things and people out there who need to cut the rattiness, but... Uh, I meant these need to cut the fatty richness, um, and the hot sauce does that very well. Another culprit could be all the fat from the ground beef too. I did not remove or strain any of it, and I feel like it um, it might have really sogged out the middle. So if I ever made these again, I would change a few things, but as far as flavor and overall quality, very good. For our next course, we're hopping over to the Noven Cake and Cookies channel to remake their potato roll or aloo samosas. You will need some flour and gochugaru, some garlic powder and vegetable oil, as well as sriracha and salt, black sesame seeds and ginger powder, ground cumin, water, cornstarch, some Yukon potatoes, some hot peppers, and some fresh cilantro. 
I did want to start by whipping up the dough, though, since it has to rest for a little bit of time at room temperature. This is going to be a very wet dough. You're barely going to knead it, so it'll be super elastic and stretchy. You want this to have less integrity than the Supreme Court of the United States. I am filming this on the Friday morning that the bullshit went down, and I was considering not talking about it, but fuck them. And if you are somebody that is unhappy about the way I'm talking about it and don't think it's a big deal, go read up on what they're planning to do next and then come back to this video. Anyways, our dough is completed. Already, we are hopping into an incredibly different kind of potato preparation. Although it starts similar with some peeled Yukon potatoes that get boiled off and riced, they are gonna get aggressively seasoned with some fresh herbs, as well as some salt and pepper and cumin and ginger. This should be very tasty at the end. And perhaps my favorite part of this recipe is the fact that we have to whip up a little bit of food glue, which is basically just equal parts of flour and water that will help seal the ends of our samosas. For some reason, I've always loved to make stuff like this and use edible versions of practical tools or crafting supplies like glue. Maybe it's because we inherently like to play with our food, or just it goes back to every child's fantasy of eating glue. Unless that was only me, and I just doubted myself on the internet to being an incredibly weird child. Our dough is gonna get rolled out nice and thin, and then lined with our logs of the potato mixture. Chopped into equally sized columns, rolled up, and then like I said, glued with the flour and water food glue mixture. I did run into a few challenges while cooking these. The potato filling browned really fast, while the dough did not take on much color at all. It could have been something with the excess flour on the outside outside or the hydration levels of the dough. I'm not exactly sure, but also when the dough eventually puffed up, I realized that I probably made these too big. They're supposed to be little tiny handheld pigs in a blanket like snacks, not giant half hot dog sized things. Either way, they smell very good. I would imagine they taste pretty good as well. So let's give them a try. Yeah, so I think these are a little too big. <laughs> I think they're more than twice the size of the ones in the video. Uh, and yes, I am reusing the bowl of sriracha from the last one. Leave me alone. I don't care. And also, yes, I put the best looking, most golden ones on the top and sides. Um, it's just what you do. Mmm. These are bomb. I love every part of this. I love the uh, spice mixture on the potatoes. They are super tasty. The outside stay nice and crisp. I love the little layers of fried dough around the outside. I would imagine the black sesame seeds are mostly there just for looks. Um, you can't really taste them at all, but it does look pretty cool. I'll give them that. Maybe hot take too, but I kind of like the size of them. If somebody just handed me a plate of these, I wouldn't be eating them thinking they should be or would normally be smaller. They're the Americanized versions. They're more giant, more surface area to suck up more deep fried oil. Very good. I would highly recommend you give them a shot if you've never made them. Um, and the best recipe of the day so far. For our third course, we're gonna be hopping over to our good buddy, Matty Matheson's channel and remaking his chicken and gravy over Aligo potatoes. I acquired some vegetable oil and chicken stock, some heavy cream and flour, butter, bone-in and skin-on chicken thighs, white pepper, and some fresh cheese curds, salt and pepper, a fresh mozzarella, some frozen peas, a lemon, and some potatoes. We have made Aligo potatoes a handful of times now on the channel. They are freaking delicious, if you are unfamiliar with them. They're basically potato and cheese goo that you can stretch so far, as far as you can reach. Typically seasoned with some fresh garlic and pepper and herbs like rosemary and thyme. This time they're gonna be a little bit different, but we will get to them in a few minutes. Let's first start working on our chicken. We can all agree that the best part of a Thanksgiving dinner or eating a roast chicken is the skin, right? Especially when it's nice and crispy, at least in my opinion. And based on the looks of this recipe, there is nothing else out there crispier than this damn chicken skin. 90% of the cooking is gonna get done on that skin side while it's down and hot in that oil. You want that skin so firm and crackable, Almost a harder outer shell than a moderate politician when asked about why they approve these lying rats. Once the chicken was done, I began work on my potatoes. Now, Maddie takes a slightly different approach. He wants you to cook these whole instead of chopping them up in smaller pieces. He claims that they will take on less water. It will result in an even more fluffy and airy potato at the end. Even though we're loading them with so much butter and cream and cheese, I don't think that really matters, to be honest. Oh, also, while those potatoes were cooking up, I whipped up the frozen peas, just with a little bit of butter, some of the potato water, and some lemon. 
Not the biggest fan of peas in the world, but I think he just adds them to this recipe for a pop of color, a little bit of a vegetal break from the other very calorie dense components that are gonna go on the final plate. One of the main seasonings that will be flavoring our potatoes is this white pepper and I don't know about anybody else, but this stuff has always smelled so gross to me. It kind of resembles like the floor of a petting zoo or a nasty old hay filled horse barn. Like, I don't know. You guys can tell me if I'm crazy or there is some validity to this because I can't be the only one. The potatoes get transformed into their final alley go form by adding in a whole bunch of warmed up butter and cream. Adding gradually, so the potatoes don't become soup, of course. And then as much fresh mozzarella and cheese curds as you need to be able to pull this mixture all the way up to your ceiling and have it not break. As Maddie puts it, essentially a pot of cheese fondue with some potatoes also involved. And finally, all of our components are gonna come together on the plate to marry, something I probably won't be able to do with my partner in a few months time. <laughs> I'm gonna need to whip the lactates out because I'm about to devour this. At the very least, I know how good the potatoes and the chicken probably are gonna be. That's why I'm most excited to eat this. But in terms of looks, not that pretty. Peas don't really do anything for me, aesthetically. This kind of looks like something you'd find at a roadside Cracker Barrel or weird backroads diner. Yes, on the potatoes though. Mmm. If you've never had potatoes like this before, and you love potatoes, and especially cheese, you gotta try it at least once. But goddamn, in every single spoonful are you eating a lot of cheese. The gravy is fine, too. Uh, it's not the best I've ever had in the world, but it's decent, it's passable. Uh, let's see how this chicken held up underneath all that gravy, though. Mmm. Every single aspect of this screams deep fried, from the juiciness of the interior, the crispiness, that golden brown saltiness, it is so damn good. Yes, there was quite a bit of oil used, but not as much as there would have been if it was deep fried. And he's right about the seasoning. All this got was salt, and especially with the gravy too, that's all you need. Usually I'd complain about that. I want more than just saltiness, but for some reason, chicken like this, and especially chicken thighs, you can get away with just salt. It is very tasty. This is an extremely delicious and satisfying combination. Uh, definitely my favorite so far today. I will be making this again, without a doubt. And lastly today, we are revisiting one of the most viral potato recipes of all time, the thousand layer, million layer, whatever you wanna call it, crispy fried potato. This one calls for some white potatoes and potato starch, some vegetable oil, salt and pepper, and chili powder. Now while the last time we did this, it was from a TikTok and it used duck fat, this one's even simpler because all we're using is a few spices, some oil, and potato starch to bind it all. It gets baked for about an hour, chopped up, and then fried for a minute, and that's really it. It does need to sit in the fridge in between the oven and oil, and there's no guarantees any stage of this will work, but you get my point. This one starts by peeling up your white potatoes and then running them through a mandolin. As per usual, watch your fingers. This is one of those kitchen tools that is just hungry for human flesh, so please use a guard or just be very careful. Your paper thin potatoes now get a generous seasoning of all the other ingredients I mentioned. Toss the coat evenly, lay down in a bread pan, and then baked in a 440 degree oven for about an hour. Now it's a good thing I got that mandolin usage over with, so I don't have to worry about injuring myself. But oh wait, I ran out of potatoes before filling up the tin, so I had to whip it back out to slice up some more potatoes off camera. If you are squeamish of bodily injury or blood at all, please look away now, this is your warning. When I tell you this is my worst kitchen injury of all time, I absolutely mean it. I adjusted the mandolin a little bit to make the slices a little bit more thicker, and when I tell you every millimeter of my thumb that could possibly go through that adjustment did. I was very close to heading over to the hospital for a stitch, especially when I noticed the piece of my finger had a little bit of fat in the damn thing. But it has been some time now and it finally stopped bleeding, so I think I'm gonna be okay. Until all the experts in the comments tell me it's an open wound, I'm gonna get an infection and lose my arm. But the show must go on. I removed my fingertip from the potatoes and <laughs> laid the rest of them on top. Don't worry, nobody's gonna be eating these except me, in case there's any residual uh, DNA left in here. And then once they come out of the oven, you have to weigh them down to make all those potato layers stick together. 
stick them in the fridge for a couple of hours, slice them into whatever shapes your heart desires. In the past, they are usually squares, but this time we are making big old rectangles, and fry them off until they get a nice golden brown all the way around each edge. All I'm saying is, these things better be worth it, so let's give them a try. All things considered, these did not come out bad. Um, obviously they're a lot shorter than the video was. The video was probably twice the height, but I kind of like the shape of these. They almost look like somebody was trying to replicate a french fry, but just very differently and more gourmet. So I'm kind of on board. I see no issue with them. Now while these taste delicious because they're deep fried salty potatoes, um, the layers are almost too thin. You can see them if you look very closely from this perspective right here, but as you're biting into it, there's no discernible layers. They kind of all mush together. I'm assuming that's directly related to the thinness of them um, and how delicate and fragile they are in there. So if I did this again, I would start on the setting that I ended up on and took my finger off with, but as per usual, very tasty. Maybe with one of these shots, you'd be able to uh, tell a little better. Eh, kind of, but not really. I hope you guys enjoyed this one. If you did, give me a big old like. If not for the video, then a pity like for my ailment. Let me know what recipes or creations you'd like to see me make next on the channel down in the comments or over on my social medias. It's David underscore Seymour one. Other than that, have a fantastic weekend. God help us all in this country and I will see you next time. Peace. Super lazy, try and make a meal tonight, they ain't pay me. Try and supersize my life with my A team. Yeah, our style wasn't wavy, but we had a vision.